going to be a fun experience. Oh, you toad. Oh, good. She she got rid of the comet about to hit her. Okay, guys. Uh, can you guys uh, mute now? We're... All right, guys. We are live. We are muted. <laughs> okay, everyone's yeah. muted. All right, some people are coming in. All right, let's get started. Welcome, everyone, to December's general meeting for the Los Angeles Astronomical Society. Yay! So tonight I will be hosting because our president, Daryl Dooley, is currently recovering in the hospital. We sent him our well wishes to recover speedily. The board and officers are supporting him in every way possible during this time. So in the meantime, I will be heading up the efforts with the help of the officers and the board who have a lot of experience, including Tim, who has been a president before, and Curtis Byram, who's also been one of our presidents before. So first off, do we have any new members in the house? Are you guys able to hear her? I know of at least one. I can hear her. Okay, I can good. hear her. Am I good? Okay. Yeah. You're good. Okay. Okay. Should I do it again? Yeah. So, hi, everyone. My name is Michael, Michael Noble. I am a telescope demonstrator here at Griffith Observatory. I've been working here for about a year now, started in November of last year. And uh, a few times I've had the opportunity to be the liaison for the, the monthly star parties that y'all do. And uh, I've just been curious about LAAS for a long time. And I honestly feel like joining is six months overdue, is what I've been saying. So, tonight on my phone, I'm sitting here and I and I have now joined and I am now a member and I'm happy about it and I'm looking forward to getting to know everyone. Welcome. Hey. Welcome. Hey, oh, can we please go? Okay. Hello. Yeah, yeah I've been uh, 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 member probably since the beginning of the year, but this is the first meeting I've been to. So I'm introducing myself. My name's David Thomas. I've uh, been working here at the observatory since the uh, reopening of the expansion, so uh, close to 16 years now. And uh, yeah, I've been looking forward to joining the club. Uh, I've been a member of the club up in the desert where I live. I live in Ridgecrest. And uh, you know, there's just not much happening in that club, so I decided to join this one. And I've uh, been coming to the star parties. You might have seen me in the last couple ones here. Uh, but thank you. Did you come all the way from Ridgecrest for this meeting? Uh, no, I had, I had a couple of, uh, I was at a, a mayor's event here this afternoon. Ah, working. Okay. No, he was working today. I would have been more impressed if he came straight from Ridgecrest. <laughs> Hi, my name is Nick Spence. Um, I just graduated college a couple months ago and moved out here. And now that I have the disposable income and free time to really pursue astronomy, I decided to jump in and uh, bought my first telescope and I'm out here. So, very cool. What'd you buy? I got a 10 inch, I got a 10 inch daub. It was. I don't know the exact company, but it was it's perfect. Really Ten inch is perfect. Yeah. Any any other new members? Do we have any new members online? Yeah. No. Okay. I'm impressed that we have a college student with disposable income. <laughs> I know that's go you for that. Power to you on that. And welcome to LAS, everyone. Welcome all the new members. Thank you. And we look forward to seeing you at the star parties. Um, OK, so let's pull up the agenda slide. Spencer, can you do that? Oh. Yeah, hang on a second. Oh, there. OK, just one second. Uh, sorry. It's OK. No worries. Okay, you see the uh, splash screen? Okay. All right, uh, let's see. Sorry, trying to multitask here. Is this what you want, Alicia? I'm sorry. Yep, that's what we got here. All right, so going over this, Spencer is going to be posting a link for the door prizes in the chat. 
that's online and everyone here hopefully got a raffle ticket. If not, we will check at the end after the presentations to make sure everyone has a raffle ticket for our door prizes. We have our 2021 20, door prizes we're giving away tonight because it's that time of the year. It's the holidays. So there's a high chance you might win something tonight actually. Um, <laughs> So the other thing is we have banquet coming up in January, as well as the deadline for the registration for the banquet is January 15th. And the ceremony for the awards will be on January 28, 2024. Mm -hmm. And then we also have a lot of LAS items for sale. We just put the jackets on order, thanks to Joe Phipps. Yay. And we have, he's going to be reaching out to the members who already placed orders to let them know when they're going to be shipped to their place. And we also will have some extra for sale from a size small to a size extra, extra large. Correct, Joe? Is that right? That's right. All right, cool. So, so we won't be shipping them. You'll have to pick them up. Okay, so you'll have to pick them up probably either from Griffith at one of the star parties at Garvey or, um, banquet. Banquet. or at the banquet. Yes. Okay. Uh, the other thing we also have for sale is from Keith Armstrong. We have custom LAS hats with and without LED lights. They're really cool. So you check them out and reach out to Keith if you want an LAS hat. We also recently announced that we'll be selling the LAS 2024 calendars for next year, which also includes the solar eclipse, all of the LAS member events, and our universal holidays. It's quite intense. So there should be... Yeah, right? <laughs> Took a lot of work, but it's got it's got a lot of holidays in there, um, which is exciting, including Parents' Day. Um, who knew that existed? Um, <laughs> but it does. All right. So next, we're going to go to the results for the election of 2024 for the board and officers. Uh, can we pull that up? All right. So the election results are Daryl Dooley as president for 2024. Vice president will be Alicia Hurst. Uh, the secretary will be Spencer Suhu. The treasurer will be John O'Brien. The new board will consist of Keith Armstrong, Curtis Byram, Victoria Fegan, Jason Fields, Rafael Gonzalez, Greg Thompson, Tim Thompson, and Dave Yackerson. So how about we give a round of applause to everyone in the results? Okay. And then moving on from there. The other thing I wanted to announce is that the Palomar tour was postponed. It most likely will be moved to next spring, correct? Yeah, sometime. So reach out to Tim Thompson if you want further information about that as well. And as you can see online, there's the link for signing up for the banquet by January 15th. And you can buy the merchandise for the hats from Keith, jackets from Joe, calendars at the link that Andy sent out. We also have the LAS website store that you can buy a lot of our merchandise from as well. Okay, uh, in terms of outreach, we have the Silver Lake Outreach coming up this Thursday. You can reach out to our events outreach coordinator, Evan Renteria, for more information. We also have this Saturday the Griffith Observatory Star Party. Uh, I think you guys will be in attendance for that as well. Uh, we look forward to having you all out there. Uh, on the same day, I know that the Santa Monica Sidewalk Astronomers is also going to be having an outreach, so you have your choice between the Griffith Star Party or Santa Monica. So we hope to see you at both of these events. Jack Eastman. Oh, yeah. Hmm? What? Oh, okay. There's always somebody on Zoom who doesn't hear. That's okay. All right, so next we have on the, for the agenda, we have the presentations for tonight. Uh, do you want to pull up the agenda so we can go over yeah. who's presenting? Okay. Hang okay. on one second. Sure, no problem. Coming in. All right, here we go. <laughs> uh, oops, it would help if I'm sharing it. Hang on one second. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. 
Yeah, just a second, and I'll post the link for the raffle section uh, tickets. Just yeah. one yeah, second. Yeah, we'll check afterwards as well to make sure that everyone has a raffle ticket for tonight's event. Okay, here we go. All right. Okay, so first off for the show and tell, we have David Nakamoto, followed by Nazir. And then David, Victoria, Richard, and then last but not least, Spencer. Each one of these presenters will have 10 minutes to talk and then a five minute Q&A, so you get a total of 15 minutes. Uh, you'll have the choice of either holding the questions till the end or doing an interaction with the audience or the Zoom online. So please indicate that and I'll check with you guys each before you come up here to go over that. Um, and if you have any questions afterwards, we'll do a, another Q&A at the end of all the presentations to make sure that the answers and have been given to the audience here in case there's any more questions. All right, so first off, Dave, why don't you come up? We've got 10 minutes for 24 images, too. Okay, most of my imaging is done from Garvey Ranch uh, Park. Occasionally, we can get galaxies with uh, that equipment up there. Uh, by the way, hold off any questions until the end, because I do have quite a few slides to go through. Most of the time, we're, uh, we're grabbing uh, star clusters, including globulars. This is M5. You can tell what it is at the bottom, so I won't go through the objects. These are more or less to the same scale, not all of them. And occasionally we get good success with the emission nebula. And occasionally we don't. The reason why it's blue on one side and red on the other side is uh, light pollution. Uh, Garvey Ranch has some of the worst light pollution I've ever seen. And we're stuck with it till 9.30 at night. That's the pillars of creation, that dark stuff in the middle there, that's the Eagle Nebula. There's a lagoon. Like I said, occasionally we get good results. But I think in the future I'm going to tamp down the red because I've learned recently that the settings on the uh, software uh, let too much red through. And we fail on some things. There's no way to process this image of M33 to get rid of that residual light pollution because if you could see, the spiral arms are typically at the same level, brightness. But we do better on the moon and so forth. Yes, if you look... See, we got the cursor there. Ah, there we go. There's Lunar V. This is the first time I noticed this Lunar V. And the first time I've noticed this. This is very, very close to uh, uh, first quarter phase. Now, this is some of the stuff I took in the first, last, and only Griffith <laughs> Star Party where I could set up the equipment and actually see something. This is through my 7-inch Mac suit off. And you can go deep sky with that same outfit. By the way, this is the first time I've seen one way or the other, both aerial and umbrial. They're tough. Oberon and Titania aren't that, aren't that bad. Back to uh, Garvey. Seeing is the main reason why this image of Jupiter is not as sharp as I would like it to be. And now this is through my own equipment at Borrego Springs, a nightfall star party. That's an old favorite. So is that one. They're very close to one another, a couple of degrees apart. And on a lark, I picked up uh, this dual, actually triple, because you can't see that guy poking through. OK. And once again, open star clusters make excellent uh, imaging projects. This is my clearest image of that one, though. That's a really tough one. To get clear. You need you need aperture and and you need uh, dark skies for contrast. And occasionally I run into an open cluster I've never seen before, heard before, or anything. This is nice. This is an open cluster. It's not a globular. 
and uh, sometimes they pair up. That's M52, and that's the bubble nebula. And there's a third object. Where is it? There's a cursor. Ah. Yeah, I got uh, photobombed by Starlink. And yes, I do not love Elon Musk for his little escapade in the sky. Um, it's amazing. This is a famous edge on. It's amazing how small some famous objects are. And it's also amazing how big some objects are. This is only part of the California Nebula, which I choose not to call it that, because here's the ears of the horse, there's the eye of the horse, and here's the mouth of the horse. Or dragon. Depends upon, depends upon uh, what you drank that night. <laughs> this is another first time object for me. Flaming Star Nebula. I typically go from one object to another, and if I notice something in between, I says, eh, I'm in the neighborhood. So I just photograph this and manage to process out most of the uh, remaining sky glow. And on my final slide, three nebulas. This is uh, the famous one in Orion. And uh, this really requires dark skies, or at least it's a lot easier. We've tried multiple times to catch this thing from Garvey, and it's even this bright part where are you? This bright part of the nebula is really tough to register from light polluted skies. So, so if you can, go to a dark sky and, and, and increase your contrast in your images. Uh, the only way to do it from an urban site is uh, narrow band filters. And we simply don't have, I don't have the patience with my own equipment. And I certainly, we certainly don't have the time over at Garvey for narrow band filters. We've got to show something within 10 minutes. You can't show anything with a 10-minute narrowband uh, exposure. Any questions? Uh, okay. Wait, wait. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, the, so the first question, I'm just trying to get your, your data down here. It says M78, okay, that's our object, 24. Is that magnification or number of images? No. That's my images. notation. 24 times 40 means 24 images each 40 seconds long. That's what I thought. And then about five images back. I'll tell you when. Two, four, five. Let's try another one. Keep going, keep going, keep going. That, uh, that looks cool. How'd you get that? I, I do all my photography through uh, um, single shot color cameras. Mm -hmm. No individual filters. Like I said, I don't have the patience. At, at, at my uh, less than youthful age. So I go with the fastest thing I can. Uh, this one, this one, I just did it on a lark. I, we've successfully photographed this thing at Garvey Ranch, again, with a single shot color camera. But I figure since we're at a dark site, let's see what kind of contrast I can get. I'm just, what that does is it produces more contrast along those dark lanes. Light pollution tends to not blur it out, but low contrast that out. I guess in particular, the, it, it is the, the spikes coming off the star? Yeah. Uh, yeah, how do you get that? Oh, that. That's an accident. See, I, I, I tried to figure out that for years. This was photographed through a 6-inch F4. So they're spider veins. Okay. But I think what happened is... And I don't intend to correct it, but I don't think the spider veins are exactly lined up on either side of the secondary. So that slight misalignment causes that effect. Because I've never seen that anywhere else. <laughs> I love that misalignment. Anyone else? Interesting question. Okay, that's it. Anything online? Yeah, we got to. <laughs> Okay. Uh, you're right, so tech. We're, we're gonna switch to Zoom if anyone online has a has a question. Give In the second. chat box. All right. Anyone on Zoom have a question for David? Don't have to look under chat. I guess we could. <laughs> I have to go upstairs. No, there's nothing on the chat. Okay, oh, there okay. There's there's the answer. Thank you, Spencer. Thank you, Spencer. Okay. Nice That's it. Next is Nasir uh, via Zoom. Uh, 
yeah. Hi. Hi, everybody. Hi. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. I'm going to share my screen. Asking for my password. Okay. Okay. I'm not sure I can still share the screen. Okay. Okay, we're seeing it now. <clears throat> um, I to record this computer screen on your deny. Okay. Uh, too many things pop up. <laughs> Let's see if it works. I don't know what's going on. Okay, there you go. Took a while, sorry. <laughs> My mouse is having some issues. I can't get rid of this thing on the top. Now, Sarah, you want us to uh, just uh, skip to the next one and you can work things out and come back later? Yeah, I don't know. My mouse is not working now. Okay. Uh, is David uh, ready? He's, oh, I think he's doing it in, in person. Okay, now, Sarah, we're going to, we're going to uh, take you off and then uh, you, can, uh, you can jump back in at the end, okay? Okay, okay. All right. Sorry. Okay, uh, Evan, you want to... Queue up, David. Okay, the mouse works uh, without the screen share, but when they start screen sharing, the mouse stops working. All right, That's, everybody can uh, hear me. Very good. Yes. Uh -huh. okay, let's go ahead to. The... Oh, okay. Excellent. All right. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, so, just by a show of hands, how many of you here have, know of or heard of Lewis Swift? Okay, so not that many. He's really somebody that should be more well-known. He is the American astronomer who discovered the most NGC and IC objects. He's really America's Herschel. And I want to tell you a little bit about Lewis Swift, a little bit about his history, which overlapped with where I grew up in Rochester, New York, and also out here in the Los Angeles area. And this is all as part of uh, an observing program that I'm putting together which visually will require a fairly large telescope, maybe 12 inches or larger, but you can probably image it with whatever you wish to have. So I'll talk a little about the story of Lewis Swift and then the Swift Observing Program. So he was uh, the American astronomer. He was uh, born in 1820 in upstate New York, and he was an amateur in every sense of the word. His, his day job after he grew up was as a hardware store owner, uh, but he was fascinated with comets, and so he became a very prolific comet hunter. He actually discovered, I believe, or, or co-discovered, 13 comets, and I'll show you a list in a bit, which I believe is the same number as Messier 
also a prolific uh, comet hunter that we're really familiar with. Uh, and he did this in from Rochester, New York, and having grown up in cloudy Rochester, New York, the second cloudiest city in the country, it really is astounding what he was able to accomplish. He was so prolific in terms of his comet hunting, winning awards from European folks would give gold medals, as well as somebody who really shared. He did a lot of outreach. He let people look through his telescopes. He was very beloved within the city of Rochester. That he ended up eventually, when he was in his 60s, having a very wealthy patron in Rochester say, I'm going to help uh, establish a really good observatory for you if that's something you want to do. And, and that's what he did. So a couple of his early influences, he did see at the age of 13, the 1833 Leonid meteor storm. Uh, he saw Halley's Comet return in 1835, and he did live long enough to see it coming back in 1910. Uh, he died shortly after that, so, but that was a big moment for him. And then the Great Comet of 1843, which was actually visible in the daytime. Uh, he looked up and saw it. He didn't actually read any announcement about it, and it was only later that he learned that uh, this comet had been discovered. But he kind of discovered it visually, but I'm sure with, all, with the throngs of other people, because it was such a bright comet. And so he's probably most famous. If anybody did raise their hand, I thought it might be because of comet periodic 109 Swift-Tuttle, which when it was first discovered was comet 1862-3. And Swift discovered it first, and then a professional astronomer, Horace Tuttle, discovered it after. And this is a fairly famous comet. It came back uh, in 1992, and that's actually a picture that I took from uh, the road up to Chantry Flats uh, off of uh, Santa Anita Avenue over in Arcadia. Uh, but it's mostly famous because this is the progenitor for the famous Perseid meteor shower. So this is the one that's scattering off its dust and debris that gives us the meteor shower in August uh, every year. So among his discoveries, uh, with his little comet catcher, which is a four and a half inch uh, a telescope, a refractor, which actually had via specialized uh, optics, an eyepiece that an optician in Rochester made for him, he was able to get a three to a three and a half degree field of view. So that's what he used to discover his comets, and he got the list of comets in there on red. But he also discovered the nebulosity around the uh, open cluster 2244, which is the Rosette Nebula. And so that was actually his discovery and his first deep sky uh, discovery. Because he was so popular with his comets and his outreach, uh, he, became, uh, he got an honorary doctorate from the University of Rochester in uh, basically 1879. But let's talk about, uh, in 1880, uh, a very wealthy Rochesterian, H.H. H. Warner. Uh, he basically sold mail order medicine as well as safes, the kind of safes that you would put valuables in. So he had a lot of different uh, irons in the fire, as it were. He was very impressed by Swift. And so in 1880, he agreed to supply the land and build an observatory if the residents of the city of Rochester would buy Swift a more worthy telescope than his four and a half inch telescope. Swift recognized that there really hadn't been, hadn't been that much done in terms of deep sky discovery. Uh, since the Herschels, with a few others. There are a few others like Stefan and a few others that did some uh, deep sky discovery, but it had mostly been ignored after William and John had done their thing in the uh, 17 and early 1800s. And so he felt that with a 16-inch telescope, he'd actually be able to kind of continue that idea of trying to discover these new deep sky objects. And so when the city of Rochester ponied up and bought him the 16-inch Elvin Clark refractor. It was the fourth largest telescope in the United States at that time. And he kind of moved away from comet hunting and started really looking in earnest for deep sky objects. Along with a sidereal clock, uh, a spectrograph, and some other things with the telescope, in today's dollars, it was about a $3 million investment from the city of Rochester, from H.H. H. Warner, and some other very wealthy businessmen in Rochester for this amateur astronomer who just impressed everybody because he was so dedicated to his work. So um, this was, and I should go uh, here first a little bit longer. So he was in Rochester with the Warner Observatory where the telescope was established. And that went all the way up from 1880 up to 1892, 1893. But in 1893, there was a great financial panic. H.H. H. Warner lost his fortune. 
the stipend that he was giving uh, Professor Swift he was there no longer. Professor Swift was also getting really fed up with the skies of Rochester. It's part of the reason I moved. And so, uh, so I understand that. So he found actually a new sugar daddy in Thaddeus Lowe of Low Mountain Railroad, of the Lowe Hotel. So just below Mount Wilson, at about 3,700 feet, the Lowe Observatory was established. It was the Echo Mountain Observatory and then Mount Lowe. And Professor Swift took the 16-inch telescope that the city of Rochester paid for, brought it out here, and as I understand it from reading articles, the city of Rochester was okay with that because they liked this guy so much. And he continued his work trying to discover these uh, deep sky objects. And he ended up discovering 1,100 is how many he cataloged, but when you get rid of duplicates and things that he uh, uh, basically were small clusters of stars that really weren't deep sky objects, it's a little bit over 800 objects, uh, unique objects that he discovered, which is the most of any American. Uh, e. E. Barnard was a close second with about 150. And so he was out here in California up until 1901. His eyesight began to fail, and then he moved back to Rochester and uh, passed away at the age of uh, 92 in upstate New York. Now, this is kind of uh, one of his uh, list of discover, or one of his, I should say, uh, H, uh, Warner Observatory uh, uh, circulars that has a list of discoveries. And these were incorporated into the new general catalog and into the index catalog uh, by Dreyer. And again, about 800 NGC and IC objects. So this was a, the, my 10-minute version of a longer presentation. But the reason I wanted to introduce Lewis Swift, if you hadn't heard about him, is that because of his Rochester and then LA connection, He's, got a, he's a guy who's very close to my heart, and especially also he was an amateur. I'm endeavoring to put together an advanced observing list of his brightest objects uh, in order to hopefully create a new program for the Astronomical League. They've got about 200 observing programs, uh, and there's very little overlap with these objects because most of the galaxies and other things they have on their list were discovered by the Herschels. And so it's, it's going to be kind of a new thing, but it is going to require telescopes that are a little bit uh, bigger. If you are interested in helping me in this endeavor, I've got a list of about 200 objects, and I'm trying to vet them. And in particular, I'd like to understand what's sort of the smallest aperture from a dark sky site that you'll be able to see. And you can kind of see from this list, I'm classifying things as either moderate, easy, difficult in telescopes of various apertures. I've got a few other folks helping me. But this is the thing that I'm working on, and this is the main thing I wanted to introduce. My email is on this slide, and so if you are interested in this list, or even if you don't want to help, but you're interested in the objects on this list, uh, please let me know, and I can send that to you. And I, hopefully I did not go too far over. Are there any questions that I can answer? Yes? Yeah. Um, fabulous presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so I'm looking at the magnitudes and I'm seeing it's around like 9 to 1415. Is that representative of the typical magnitudes? Yeah, so for this list what I did was I looked at the uh, visual magnitude that was provided. Uh, there's a, a, a author named uh, Dr. Snecky, Wolfgang Snecky, who actually did a deep dive into who discovered what NGC and IC objects. And so he provided an Excel file, which is invaluable, and I give him credit in my Excel file uh, for what he, what he provided, which has the visual magnitude. I used 13 as an arbitrary cutoff, and so that got me down to about 225 objects, uh, with the exception of a couple planetary nebulas that were dimmer, but pretty easy to see with a filter. Uh, and what I'm trying to do now, though, is really determine, is this sort of arbitrary visual magnitude cutoff is it good? Because some objects are really easy to see, other objects are really difficult. I'm doing all of my observing with a 17 and a half inch dab. Of course, he discovered all these with a 16 inch. And so, again, part of the question is how low can you go? And I do have some observers with a 13 inch dab that are also uh, working the list. But I arbitrarily chose a visual magnitude of 13. Oh, thank you. Any other questions in here? Yeah, how do 
dark of a sky do you think you need for that? So uh, in terms of, so the, oh, we got the question. So in terms of imaging, I don't really think you need that dark of a sky at all. These are all NGC and IC objects, and I'm only choosing the brighter of, you know, 200 of the 800 that he has. I'd like to get the list down to a smaller number before I submit it as a program, uh, but I figured this is a good candidate list. Um, now, the observing that I've been done visually, and I've been able to see a lot of them from the Los Angeles site, I also observe out by Amboy Crater. You know, I think that if you've got Bortle 3, you know, Bortle 3 or better skies uh, should be fine. Of course, it all kind of comes down to aperture as well. You know, so if you have a really big aperture, you can kind of find a lot of these things in more light polluted skies. But for those who want to try it with imaging, I, don't, I think aperture is probably not that big of a deal. You can probably do it with, you know, four or five inch apertures and, and even under moderately light polluted sky, potentially with filters, but long exposure times. David, okay, any other do questions we know what in happened? here before we go to Zoom? All right. Oh. On ask, you can ask Spencer on Zoom. Uh, on Zoom, the, the question is, uh, where's the 16-inch Clark now? Oh, excellent question. Yeah, so this uh, presentation I did was my 10-minute version of a longer presentation. So after uh, Thaddeus Lowe kind of had his own financial problems, uh, there was the Echo Mountain Railway. And so Southern California Railroad, and I may be having, saying that a little wrong, but the folks who owned that railway that Thaddeus Lowe was leasing from, they basically took possession. The Echo Mountain Observatory continued operation up until 1927 when it actually was, the structure was lost, not to a fire, but to a windstorm. Knocked down the building, but they saved the telescope. So then it ended up with the railroad. They sold it to Santa Clara University. Uh, up in the uh, in Santa Clara, up in the Bay Area, uh, and in the 1990s, actually, graduate students had restored it, and I've always wanted to go see it. Well, apparently, around 2000, they had to do a whole big seismic retrofit and also get rid of asbestos in the Ricard Observatory at Santa Clara, and so the telescope disappeared, and I have no idea where it is. And there's both myself some members in the Rochester Club, because this, is, this telescope is actually the symbol, the insignia of the Rochester Astronomy Club because of that Rochester connection. And so there's a lot of us trying to figure out where that scope ended up. I have sent many emails to anybody that I can find at Santa Clara University. If there's any alumni here that can help me with this quest, I would love to find out what happened to this telescope. But right now, the last we know, up until about 15 years ago, it was at Santa Clara, and now we don't know. Any other questions on Zoom? All right, thank you very much. Okay, I guess we can go to the next. Uh, yeah, so actually, Nasser, are you ready? You're muted. Uh, yeah, hi there. Yeah, yeah, I'm ready right now. I can, we can try again. Okay, I was just the uh, mouse was not working, but I can, I guess I can if it just still doesn't work, I can use my keyboard to just All move right, okay. the slides on. All right, okay. Yeah. So let me share my screen again. Okay, so here, as usual, every year I do my uh, uh, presentation of all the photographs that I take in the current year from my backyard. And as uh, Dave Nakamoto was saying, uh, he doesn't have patience for narrow band. And actually, I also didn't have any patience early when I started this hobby. But when COVID hit and I decided to do imaging from my backyard and I said, okay, I have to do some narrow band because the full band was just unbelievable results. <laughs> so once I got the results with narrow band, then basically my patients came back and you have to deal, the patients were worth it. So anyway, so today 
I'm just showing you all the mostly nebulas and galaxies that I do for my backyard. Nebulas are mostly narrow band and galaxies are RGB, but very long exposures, 10 to 20 hours plus. And that's why you need a lot of patience, multi-night exposures. So, but before I go to those uh, deep sky objects, I just wanted to show you this eclipse that happened recently, annular eclipse. And I was supposed to go to Utah and get the full nice annular ring, uh, 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 ring shape imaging. But <laughs> on the last minute, Booking.com canceled just one day before cancel my booking and I just couldn't find anything and I had to deal with the, from my backyard. So this is how the moon it just shows the how the moon travels the face of the sun at the maximum. I guess it was about 87% or 78% in Los Angeles. And uh, another object from the solar system is this comet that I came in February, and yeah, I didn't do a good job on this. It's just a luminance filter, no RGB, no narrowband, nothing. And this is the best I got. So that's that's for my solar system stuff this year. And I'll just switch to nebulas. And so many of the objects that I've done, I'm gonna to show tonight, I've done it before also. But the reason I'm showing it again is every time, because I've got a better telescope now, and also I'm doing long exposures and a better processing tools, especially uh, in Pix Insight, we got this new uh, plugins, which are AI based, I guess, and that's really helped a lot in processing and limiting noise and uh, blur, 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 Ordinates of these stars. So I reimaged most of the objects, and I, uh, the results are much, much better than what I used to have get before. So let's, uh, and since I have a telescope which is uh, not, uh, the field of view is much narrower because its high magnification is a 900 millimeter Explorer Scientific 140 millimeter telescope. So the field, this is like a half hearted attempt of heart nebula. <laughs> so there's no pun in, in, intended here. Uh, it's basically half the heart, but this is basically the center of the heart nebula. And you can see the details here much better than what I had done, I got before. And this color scheme is Hubble palette. And this is the regular color scheme in the uh, RGB, but still narrow band. This is a Pac-Man, it's 14 hours of narrow band. And also I just wanted to let you know that the skies that I image from a backyard is basically bottle nine level almost, extremely light polluted, but uh, long exposure in narrow band and good processing gives a pretty decent results. Here's another one that I've done it before, but this time, yeah, it's much, this is the best I've ever done before. A lot of details in this. And of course the famous pillars of creation. And yeah, and this is normally when you start your hobby, this is the first object you take. And I've done it a zillion times. And this is probably the, my best ever. <laughs> and this is only one hour RGB from my backyard and yet, and this is because of uh, new plugins, AI-based plugins in Pixinside. Yeah, it, it gives a pretty good results by limiting the noise and gives, you can see a lot of zoomed in. I've got this zoomed in here, the neck of this Orion Nebula. You can see so much details here. It's just uh, awesome. <laughs> Here's uh, two versions of Tulip Nebula. One is regular color scheme of RGB 
and I'll just otherwise I have a palette. Preferred Nebula, this again, more details in there. The best I've done. California. Uh, yeah, just this is just two hours of narrowband, age alpha only. I've done many times full color, but this is uh, just age alpha and got uh, quite a few details in this. This is reset six hours of only H alpha. And I just did this recently, like two days ago. And the scene was terrible. I know it was very windy, but yet I got this result. It was, the details are just unbelievable. You can see all these fine uh, nebulosity details in there. This is the zoomed in version of the center of the Rosette Nebula. Uh, look at all the details. It's just unbelievable. I also did this yesterday. <laughs> oh, I just wanted to try and see how it works. This is six hours of just H alpha narrowband. And again, the best ever I've taken with all the details in there. This is just an okay image towards helmet. This two hours. Now this one, I tried uh, mosaic. Uh, I never tried mosaic before. And this is a four panel mosaic, but there were some issues with the alignment of the camera. That's why the mosaic didn't turn out to be nice and smooth. There's some kind of a gap in the top. But uh, yeah, I have to do some more work on mosaic. Do some more. Uh, this is a lot of work because, of course, if you want to do color also, it's all basically four times the work for the normal single image. And again, Rosette also, I tried to do four panel mosaic. And again, the issue with the alignment. Now do some galaxies. This time I didn't do too many galaxies. Uh, something this is I've done before, but again, a better image this time. I got this full view of NGC 733 and Stephen Quart uh, Quartet. Uh, you can see the zoomed in version on the right. This is again, just a galaxy. It's five companions, smaller galaxies. This is, I love it. Uh, I've done this many times, but this time it just the uh, blur exterminator and noise exterminator of the AI effects and set plugins have done magic. <laughs> beautiful colors and details in there. The dust lanes are awesome. This is a pinwheel, uh, no, triangulum M33. Lots of H alpha regions in there, a lot of reds. <laughs> Some star clusters, this is M2, just one hour RGB. This is M3, yeah. The colors are not quite right in this, but I love this star cloud in Sagittarius. There's some dark patches, which is, I guess, because of the dark clouds there, the dust. But, uh, wow. So many stars, but I'm surprised that there's no blue stars. I don't know if it's my coloring or issues with there or some, for some reason, I only see yellow and white and some red, but no blue. <laughs> anyway, that's the end of my images that I did this year. It was the first half of the, half of the year was the weather was terrible. So I guess it's mostly done in the later half of the year. And this is the list of my 
equipment and software that I use. This is Explore Scientific 140 millimeter refractor and uh, basically all other stuff are ZWO. Basic stuff, nothing really fancy and expensive. And I use Nina mostly for imaging on my Windows computer. And then I do processing in Pix inside on my Mac. And this is the, just a basic workflow that I use. Uh, you can read through this. I use this uh, script in Pix inside to do basic calibration and alignment and crop. Then I do my cropping, background extraction. And then once in the non-linear, um, a linear phase, I apply this noise exterminator and blur exterminator on the on narrow band, linear images, and get the colors if it is a color-based. And uh, by ground neutralization, I take out excess green, then color calibration, then change from linear to non-linear. And then some final touches, Not nothing too fancy, just curve fitting, curve stretching, improve colors, and then final little fine tuning in iPhotos in, on Mac. So that's it. Uh, if you guys have any questions, Are there any questions in here? Ha, huh. we have a busy man with questions. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, two questions. Can everyone hear me in the Zoom? Okay. Nasir, those were uh, jaw-dropping photos. I'm just wondering what you have coming down the pike for 2024, what your goals are for um, more observing. <laughs> Well, sky's the limit, but uh, yeah, I have to pick some something really new because I'm pretty much exhausted with all the very bright objects. But no, I, I haven't made any plans yet. But actually, no, I do want to focus on more wider uh, images, wide field of view. And for that, I have to do mosaic. And I have to work on that, how to create a nice mosaic, four panels or nine panels to get the really big view. Or especially I want to do also the Orion constellation with all the nebulas in it. That will require maybe four, nine or 16 panels mosaic. So yeah, that's one of my goals of 2024. Anything else in here? It looks like there are a number of questions on Zoom. Spencer, can you handle those? Sure. So the first one is, uh, is what, what's your new, new telescope? What's my telescope? Yeah, what's your new telescope? Oh, this is Explore Scientific uh, ES 140 millimeter refractor. OK. And the second question is, is Pix Insight available for the Mac? Uh, sorry, can you repeat? The, is Pix Insight available? Yeah, yeah. Pix Insight is both, uh, you can, for both Mac and Windows, you have, yeah. And I usually use Mac for Pix Insight. That's it on the Zoom. Okay, I guess it's time to go to the next presenter. Okay, so I think Victoria had signed up, uh, but I don't see her on the Zoom at all. So we'll uh, jump to Richard. You're up. Great, thank you. I will share my screen here. Okay, hopefully... Everyone can see that? Yes. Great. Uh, well, 
I will keep this as brief as possible here, but I wanted to give everyone an update on uh, a project that I talked about about a year ago uh, at the, the previous December meeting, the Pi Finder. Um, I will just quickly answer this question. Uh, it is a pointing device for telescopes that is self-contained. It does plate solving. It's got an accelerometer. Uh, so it basically takes the place of digital setting circles, but without any of the encoders or other sort of accoutrement that you may need to actually bolt to your scope. Uh, you can see this as a dovetail, so it fits just right as a like nine by 50 right angle uh, correct image finder might. And it's got a screen and keypad, onboard camera, does everything sort of in the unit to figure out where the telescope is pointing and give push to guidance to um, well, various objects that you may wanna look at. Uh, so why, why this thing? Well, I had uh, a digital setting circles on my scope. I wasn't really satisfied with their performance. I didn't like the setup of them uh, because of the way my scope was constructed. It tended to, to lose uh, alignment and accuracy uh, as I was observing and moving the scope to the sky. Uh, so I got this idea in my head to make something that was based on plate solving. I felt like the technology was there uh, and it seemed like it would be really great to know for sure where the telescope was pointing, uh, especially looking at really faint objects. Uh, there's always the question of, am I in the right spot or is my observing skills just not quite up to the task? Uh, so if we can remove one of those and I know that I'm pointed in exactly the right spot that I just, you know, it's all on me at that point. Um, so uh, the Pi Finder idea was born. Uh, this was sort of what I sketched out. Like, what do I want out of this? I just want uh, more useful observing time. I don't get a ton of time to observe. Uh, I want it to be quick to get going. I want it to be smooth and sort of effortless, uh, ideally. Uh, as I spoke about a little bit, uh, I wanted just more certainty. Uh, am I actually looking at the object that I think I am and I'm just not seeing it or as I'm you know, completely off base uh, location wise? And then just some logistic things. I wanted it to be uh, dim and uh, you know night vision friendly, especially under really dark skies. Uh, some amount of custom customizing would be nice for observing lists or different catalogs. Um, I like to log all my objects. I'm sort of into the stamp collecting aspect of uh, of the hobby. So I wanted to make sure that it, I could log things as I was observing them. Um, and I thought that it would just kind of be a fun project to bring together some of my passions of, uh, you know, developing software, a little bit of hardware hackery and astronomy in kind of one, one big package. So about this time last year, uh, this is where I was at. So I had a prototype unit. It uh, basically worked but the software was uh, very rough around the edges. The design was a little rough. Um, as you can see, it didn't have a backlit display at this point. Uh, so the first time I took it out, that was uh, pretty obviously uh, a, a, missed, <laughs> a missed feature. Um, so this was it, December 2022. Um, I you know, talked to uh, this wonderful club about it. First people I shared it with um, got great feedback. And here we are a year later, um, have several different flavors of this thing for different types of scopes. Uh, I like to think the design is a little bit more refined. The software has absolutely been through a, a quite a bit of revisions. Uh, it now has full um, kind of web interface, so you can use it, uh, either configure it or use it remotely via a cell phone if that's uh, something that you want to do. Um, so uh, I think it's made really good progress and to a large extent, that's been because of the great interaction that I've had at club events, talking to people, um, and so forth, which kind of brings me to what I actually got out of this project. Uh, so I did get a Pi Finder, and that's great. I use it uh, all the time. It's really um, better than I, I could have hoped for. Um, and it has more stuff in it than I knew that I wanted. And all of that is because I was able to kind of push it up against, uh, you know, people's expectations, talk to people about it at star parties and so forth, uh, and just gather all sorts of incredible feedback. Um, I didn't really anticipate that it would be um, such an icebreaker, 
but I've met more people in amateur astronomy hobby over the last year than I have in the previous 10 years that I've been observing. And some of that is just me having to get out more and talk about this. But part of it is just, um, you know, making more time to get out to, to star parties and socialize. And it's one of the, the parts of the hobby that I really enjoy quite a bit. Um, I've done more observing because I need to take this thing out and test it more. Um, I get to go to star parties uh, now as part of my budding little uh, side business, which gives me a little bit more encouragement and excuse. Uh, I also got a bunch of businessy stuff that I wasn't really intending, um, kind of unintended consequences, business licensing, taxes, logistics, that sort of stuff. Um, but how much observing did I get? Well, since um, the last uh, version of this this presentation, um, I've been using the same unit, that prototype unit. It, I've reconstructed a, a bunch of times, but I've been using it uh, pretty continuously. Uh, looks like I've done 31 hours of observing uh, over the last year. Uh, and that's, you know, actively observing, so not set up time or anything like that, just logging objects uh, from start to finish. Uh, 301 different objects uh, in 69 different sessions, but uh, that's probably a little deceiving because the early version would... Uh, not always complete a full observing session in one in one sitting. Um, but it's been, I think, uh, a great success. I've really enjoyed it uh, quite a bit. I'm just cognizant of time here. So I'm going to just blow through some of these. Um, here's the, the year in review. I uh, had the presentation December 15th last year. Um, I did a, an announcement on cloudy nights. Uh, sold the first unit to someone who asked about it. And I hadn't really even thought about like putting a kit together. Um, I put together a community on Discord. Uh, Keith, who probably a lot of us know, uh, was one of the first people, I think the first person uh, from the LAAF to um, raise their hand and has been providing valuable feedback and uh, just basically letting everyone know about it uh, since, which has been fantastic. Um, I picked up the first person who's uh, contributing to the project uh, out of their own time, uh, amateur astronomer in Belgium. Um, opened up an online store. Um, I can verify about this date that there's a hundred of these things out in the world. I had, you know, put together a few of them, but a lot of people put together uh, more of them from the designs that are available online. It's free. Uh, had the one year anniversary of me starting the uh, folder on my <laughs> computer in October. Um, a few other things. And here we are uh, a year from what I feel is like the official start of the project. Uh, with his presentation, have a couple of my favorite sort of community built uh, pie finders here, a couple other images of people that have built these things around the world based on the design. Um, there's at least five different sort of broad styles for refractors and Dobsonians and Smith Cassegrins and so forth that people have kind of come up and we've remixed together. Um, 208 people are active discussing their observing sessions and so forth. Um, I've shipped out 118 different bits and pieces to help people build these things, uh, from, you know, fully assembled units to, uh, you know, a PCB or maybe, a, you know, a couple pieces of hardware just to get people going. Um, there's a lot of stuff about source code here, uh, because it's continually plate solving, uh, it's at, at least solved, uh, all the units in the wild, uh, six, seven, probably significantly more than that now. This was a few months ago that I worked out this number, but um, images solved. So plate solves uh, completed there. A uh, couple more photos of, again, uh, some of my favorite um, kind of pie finders on stuff. Uh, someone emailed about the building a Hadley recently on the, on the email list. Uh, the pie finders are very popular in the Hadley groups. So you can see there's, there's two Hadleys here. Uh, it's a 3D printed uh, small telescope. They're really fantastic. Um, and if we have time for questions, I have time for answers. Uh, thanks for letting me kind of race through a lot of that information. Questions, questions. Here's a question. Yeah, how is it powered? Uh, it can be powered from your scope. 
uh, my scope has power on it uh, to run dew heaters and fans and such. So I just plug it into five volts on the scope. Uh, otherwise, it, it can be uh, built with an internal battery that lasts between four and five hours of observing. Um, that's the most popular option by far. I kind of figured uh, most people would power it from their scope because that's what I did. And I had a very sort of, uh, you know, I don't know, I guess my own uh, view of things. But uh, yeah, most people run it off of off of battery. Any other questions in here? I see a couple in the chat. Uh, what's the cost? Handle the Zoom. Yeah, so um, if you build it yourself, the parts are about two hundred and ninety dollars, um, and you just need a little bit of soldering expertise and a screwdriver and a three D printer. Uh, you can order all the parts online, have them shipped to your house, spend a few hours. I think enjoyable hours building it. Um, I sell them fully assembled uh, for five fifty to six hundred dollars, depending on exactly the the bits and pieces uh, that you want, and that's just to cover time and some of that goes back into um, you know ordering parts and so forth for kind of continued development of the unit. But it's fully open source, uh, so you can build it yourself, source all the parts, and that's definitely the least expensive way to to, to get one of these. I've read on your website that the unit has an internal GPS. What What is the function of the GPS relative to plate solving? Sure, uh, that that's a great question. So, um, it uh, it's designed primarily for push to instructions for <laughs> alt uh, as telescopes. So to go between uh, knowing where you are, right ascension declination at a particular patch of sky, and then knowing where you need to to slew the scope and in azimuth and altitude, you need to know the position on Earth and the time, and that's what it mainly gets from, from the GPS signal. Um, it's one thing to, to point out here that you turn it on and you don't need to do any star alignment, nothing like that. It takes a photo of the sky, it knows where it's pointing based on that star pattern, and then it can combine that with the GPS uh, you know, location and time information to do all the transforms that are required to go from um, equatorial to, to um, Altaz, and provide all the the push to guidance, which is nice so for we, beginners because some of them get hung up on like multi star alignment and and so forth for um, kind of traditional DSCs. So when you move the telescope, it's the accelerometers and not the GPS that's telling you where the telescope is pointing now. Yeah, once it knows where it is on the on the surface of the Earth and what time it is, it's not using the GPS um, any further. Uh, as you move the scope, the accelerometer will take the last plate solve and give you an estimate of where it's pointing. Uh, when you stop, it will do another plate solve and remove any error. Uh, and the plate solve under a dark sky like it as gas, um, it can do two plate solves a second. So it's pretty quick once you stop, it'll you know correct out any residual error. How well does it work on your Bortle 9 sky? <laughs> uh, surprisingly well, actually. One of the things that um, has been great uh, feedback from uh, Keith and, and other folks who have used it for outreach is that, uh, you know, sometimes you can get an object like M13 and it can look okay through the eyepiece, but it, it can be tricky to find it in light polluted skies. Um, and it will actually, uh, with, you know, a little bit longer exposure, a second, uh, maybe a little bit more than a second, it can punch through that light pollution and let you know actually where uh, the scope is pointing and then where the object that you want to find is. So once you get it in the eyepiece, you know, you can get some of the brighter uh, sort of star clusters that you may not be able to star hop to under really light polluted skies. Okay, so there's no more questions in here. Um, no more questions on Zoom. One more on Zoom can be usable at Ford Observatory. Uh, well. uh, I'm not familiar with that, but if it <laughs> if it needs pointing accuracy, then uh, yes, especially if it's alt as We're still working on some of the uh, equatorial mounting um, transforms. So that's a little rough around the edges right now. Oh, sure. Well, it's equatorial then. And yeah, as long as you're willing to let it plate solve, uh, the accelerometer won't give great um, feedback in, in equatorial mode because it's got a little bit more complicated rotations and so forth. Um, Certainly, it'll tell you exactly where you're pointing when the when the telescope is stationary, and then it can give you you know twenty degrees this way, 
10 degrees that way to, to get to an object. Okay, My understanding so, yeah. is Celestron has a plate solving thing based entirely uh, on a uh, on a smartphone, an iPhone, apparently. Uh, it looks as though a smartphone has all of the hardware requirements uh, to do what your Raspberry Pi does. Yep. Um, and that's a that's a nice system. I've used it quite a bit. Um, but it, it kind of suffers from having to support a lot of different phones. And the phones tend to have a really wide field of view, which reduces accuracy. Um, you know, the Pi Finder is looking at a 10 degree field of view. Uh, so it can really get exactly where you're pointing at and it can plate solve a little bit. Uh, faster. Um, but the star sense is a nice system. Uh, it's, it's less expensive. I guess you've got, got to buy a telescope for it, but theoretically, because you're leveraging the hardware that you already have in your phone, um, it's, it's an interesting way to go. And I think you're going to see more and more of that sort of fusion, um, especially as the cameras and phones get, you know, increasingly good. Has our missing Thank presenter you. showed up? Uh, yeah, she, she, she has, but I'm going to go next and then, then we'll have, her uh finish it off okay well thank you all uh thank you to the presenters as well all right so um mine is uh, playing hide and seek with the aurora borealis in iceland and uh let's see so i'm going to just talk a little bit about it do a little bit about solar activity in the Aurora, uh, what the colors you see, and then talk about the best times and places to view, and then actually some uh, some things that I've learned the hard way about shooting the Aurora. So, um, <clears throat> so I made three trips to Iceland. Um, the uh, first one was 2019. So I uh, ran into this guy who was organizing a group of nine photographers, and our specific, our sole objective was go to Iceland and see the Aurora. So as luck would have it, we landed there just as the hurricane was breaking up over the Atlantic. And so we spent most of our nights chasing holes in the clouds and were successful two out of the six nights. But we did circumnavigate the island. So, uh, But we didn't see anything else except the Aurora because we spent all of our nights out chasing holes in the clouds. Second trip was 2022 because I wanted to see what I missed during the daylight in Iceland. And so then, uh, but it was, there were storms and clouds on three of the six nights, but, but we saw Aurora three, three out of the six nights. Again, we drove completely out around the island, but we didn't really go out of the way to see the Aurora. My third trip was earlier this year. And so we just focused on Southern Iceland because there's a lot of things that we wanted to see there. And so we were pretty successful. Saw it four out of five nights and seeing a active volcano was on, was on my bucket list, but I missed that by three weeks. So I'm really bummed about that. So the minute that one erupts, I'm on a plane out of here. Uh, so these are some pictures that, that we saw. Uh, so these are all the all my photographs. So that's right outside one of our hotels. And the, just some more pictures of the Aurora. Um, <clears throat> this is um, just a little bit of background. So you know, as everybody knows, the sun has this 11 year cycle. So right now we're uh, nearing a solar maximum again, so peaking in roughly 2025. Uh, as you know, that uh, we've got the solar wind, so more activity means that we have more particles hitting the Earth. And so it hit, interacts with the magnetic shield. And so basically the way the, um, the physics of it are that you have uh, what I call auroral circles. So the aurora tend to occur in circles or ovals around the both poles. And so I'm, I'm not going to get into it because I know absolutely nothing about solar dynamics and astrophysics. So I'll leave that to, to the people who know much better than me. Uh, I just <clears throat> enjoy the, uh, the sights. So the green aurora are the most common. And so that's, that's basically uh, coming from the uh, charged particles interacting with high oxygen in the upper atmosphere. And you see green mostly because your eye is most sensitive to green. You do see reds, and then blue and purple are less common, and then yellow and pink are really rare. So as you can see in this picture, these two pictures, you tend to see the reds at the upper end of a, a curtain like this, and the, lots of greens. 
So best time is spring or fall. And generally, like you said, like I said, you know, because of the, aurora, the way the aurora ovals are, they're at the higher lati latitudes. And uh, also there are fewer hours of darkness. So if you go in the summer, um, the, uh, you have fewer hours of darkness, but in spring or fall, um, you've got, uh, that's, that slide is wrong. So you've got more hours of darkness in the, uh, in the spring or fall. Uh, winter is problematic because you've got more storms in those areas. Um, and then I screwed up last time. I didn't, uh, the second time when I didn't pay attention to the phase of the moon. And so the full moon is really hindering uh, views of the aurora. But you can see in this picture, despite the full moon there, you can still see the aurora going from one horizon to the other. And uh, it's just uh, pointed out where Capella, Mars, uh, Gemini, and then this is the Big Dipper. So these are the aurora through the clouds. Um, so if you look up and, um, and uh, you can see, you see clouds, uh, they're grayish clouds. Uh, and if you take out your phone or a camera and take a picture of it, uh, if they're greenish, then they're, they're aurora. If they're not, then they're, they're regular clouds. And then in this picture, actually, we had the, uh, the aurora through clouds and then light pollution from a nearby town that was lighting up the, uh, the sky, making it sort of yellowish in color. So um, when you're chasing aurora, there's something called a KP index that you want to pay attention to. And basically, these lines show uh, where the aurora is visible depending on the KP level. So a KP is an is a index of magnetic, geomagnetic disturbances. And so generally, uh, 0 to 2 or 3, is, 0 to 2 is quiet. 3 is what they call unsettled. So this all refers to solar activity as well. And so like you see here, if it's a KP0, you're not going to see the aurora very far south. But if it's a KP9, you'll see it like in the, uh, through the Midwest. And so all, this, all the trips I was on, the, it was either KP1 or KP3. And I'm getting really excited. I'm kind of bummed out because I left Iceland. The day I left Iceland, there's a KP5 that hit. And so some of the pictures, some people who shot, shot the aurora are just phenomenal. So I, I see another trip to Iceland in my future or someplace north. Uh, if you're chasing the aurora, two sites you want to pay attention to. This is probably the most important one. This is the Ice Icelandic Meteorological Service, and they have aurora forecasts. And so when you go to their site, you get a map like this. So this is in black. You can see the outline of Iceland. And the way you read this thing is that the areas that are in white don't have any clouds, very low clouds. Areas that are in blue, uh, green are overcast. And then this gives you the KP level. So as of Sunday, KP2. So you had a chance of seeing the aurora in these white areas in southern and uh, western Iceland, but nothing on the eastern part of Iceland here. I'm sorry, I've got my, my directions messed up. This is western Iceland, Iceland here. Anyways, you get the point. And uh, you know, it's a three-day forecast. You just move the slider around and to see, uh, it'll give you the forecast. This is updated every three hours or so. So when we were first hunting Aurora, that's we we're um, paying attention to this, um, looking at it every day, trying to figure out where to go. And then this is from uh, NOAA, and it shows you what the uh, Aurora Oval looks like. So uh, when you're shooting the Aurora, like I mentioned earlier, when you're, when you're going out and you're looking at night and you see some grayish clouds, and if they look like they're moving a little bit, the best way to tell if it's just storm clouds or aurora is just take a, your cell phone or a camera and take a five to 10 second exposure. The clouds are greenish, they're aurora. If they're not, then they're just regular clouds. And so this is what I, this is so over a waterfall that I was near. Uh, so I took one shot and I said, okay, there's some aurora there. So I waited a few hours, a couple, I waited maybe an hour. And so it started to develop stronger and I, you can see the Pleiades right here. And then uh, probably about an hour later, it was a full-blown aurora. So this was taken with a handheld. Uh, so these first two were taken with a, a camera, a iPhone on a tripod. This third one was just a handheld 
Uh, so it was bright enough that a, a, a cell phone picked it up. So um, I had two cameras I was using. I was using a Nikon D5300 with a wide angle lens, using an intervalometer. And sometimes uh, the first trip, the guy who organized the trip had a strobe with him to illuminate the foreground. So here's with um, uh, the uh, Nike, the DSLR 800 uh, ISO 800 10, 10 millimeter uh, wide wide angle 15 second exposure f4 to clearly pick out the aurora. Here's another one, same same location, and then this one was a longer exposure. You can actually it was bright enough to see the aurora reflecting off the water in the bay here. This one uh, was a waterfall, and the guy who organized the trip had a really big strobe light with him, and he flashed it. So we had our cameras, our lenses, our shutters open, and so he flashed it, and so uh, that eliminated the waterfall. And so we were able to capture both the aurora and the waterfall in, in one shot. Um, several ways of taking the aurora. So uh, you can use... Uh, this is a, uh, I took uh, 720 20 second exposures and spliced them together over a two and a half hour period. So that's what that one looks like. And so you can really see the, the aurora as it forms and moves through the night. And you can see the clouds moving overhead. So the other way of doing it is you can use your iPhone in a time lapse mode. And so this is about one and a half hours. So again, you put the, the phone on a tripod and just turn it on in time-lapse mode and you set it for 10 second exposures and that's what you get. And then the third way is just, if the roar is bright enough, you can just video. And so this is just handheld, just video of the Aurora. And so that was going from one horizon to another. And then uh, there's a geothermal plant that was off that that had the pink. Uh, they had uh, lavender lights illuminating the steam that was coming out of the geothermal plant. This was by the Blue Lagoon, which and that site is uh, where the uh, that volcano might erupt in the in the near future. Okay, let's see. So that's that's my quick presentation. Any questions? Any questions in here? No questions? Oh, no, I do have a question. Okay. Yeah. One snuck in. Okay, what's the question? Does uh, University of Alaska have similar uh, uh, prediction uh, software <laughs> online, similar to what you showed us for Iceland? Uh, I have not checked, to be honest with you. Uh, I basically, um, you know, after I, I went to Iceland the first time, uh, I just fell in love with Iceland. So that's why. That's, and and I know I've been there enough times. I know where where to look or you know where to go. So, but I, I've never really checked at University of Alaska. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Great. Uh, excellent presentation. My question is, um, how did you? learn how to track aurora uh you mentioned briefly that there was a guide was this like a sort of um like a tourist kind of experience did you pay for a guide um how did you get around iceland i guess paint the picture for me a little. okay <laughs> all right well the the first time uh the first time i went with i went with a guy who is a professional storm chaser yeah uh, i had uh, met up with him in texas uh he was doing a he was giving me a class on how to shoot the Milky Way and doing uh, things like light painting the uh, the landscape as you're shooting the Milky Way, and so I, I my my wife suggested I go check you know go take the tour uh, take that trip in Texas with him and so I did, and then so I was talking to him and he said oh by the way I'm planning a trip to Iceland if you're interested and I said sure sign me up, and so uh, he uh, takes nine people he rents a van. And uh, he arranges for Airbnbs that you stay at, and uh, he picks out the sites, and uh, he'll have equipment like strobe lights to light things up. And so that was the first trip. 
And the second, then after that, I said, you know, I could do this myself. And so basically the trick is to be mobile. And so I rented a car, uh, mapped out a route uh, around the Iceland, around Iceland to spots that I thought would be uh, far enough in the country that you wouldn't have to worry too much about light pollution and just uh, winged it. And, um, and uh, like I said, the first time I went, uh, we were, you know, the sole purpose was to see the aurora. So we, we would sleep during the day and just chase aurora at night. The second trip, I sort of knew the spots I wanted to go to and spots I wanted to see. And so if we happened to see aurora there, that was icing on the cake. And so we got lucky. And then the third trip was the same. But, yeah, definitely the trick is to have your own car um, and be flexible and mobile. I saw a question online asking if the KP index was seasonal and asking about the software dip of where you would look for the aurora. The KP index is not seasonal, it's the sun, and that southward dip is caused by the fact that the geomagnetic North Pole is well into Canada in the direction of Canada from the geographic North Pole and the auroral circles are, are around the geomagnetic pole not the geographic pole. And it's already almost 9.30. I think we should move on to yeah, the okay. next presenter. All right. Okay, great. I'll, you know, if you guys want to ping me later, I can answer some of the questions. All right, Victoria, you are next. Hi, thanks, Spencer. Um, I'll share my screen. Actually, I'll share my page. Um, great. One second. Yeah. So, uh, thanks to everyone that presented before me. And, um, I'm sorry I was very rude and late. As some of you may know, I am actually not in town and I'm two hours ahead, so I, I fell asleep. <laughs> and um, I flew in um, to where I am in Nashville now, um, so I apologize. Uh, I felt I flew in last night, so I just had a very long day. Um, so I, I just, um, I, I told a few members that I was going to be working on this, and uh, I was actually Joe who encouraged me to present um, present this today to everyone because uh, I was I was in the middle of working on it and 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 Joe is like you should just show your progress and uh, so his encouragement really got me to uh, push a little harder to get a little bit more done in the last couple of weeks on this pamphlet so this is the, the new this will be the new LA pamphlet um, hopefully in uh, a couple of weeks we'll be able to start printing them out um, so I also want to thank Evan um, because he's the one that provided me with the previous brochure. And he also provided me with the pamphlet or the um, logo that I, both of which he designed himself previously. So thanks to Evan as well. And then lastly, I want to thank Daryl because Daryl's the one who originally asked me to do this. And I'm sure it was like pulling teeth with me because I was Keep, kept telling him, I'm, I can't right now, I'm so busy, I'm so busy. And then the last couple of weeks, I've had some real, real time on my hands. So I've been able to put some stuff together and go through a lot of our archive images and and um, uh, figure out a new layout and, and design and, and stuff like that. So uh, lastly, I do want to thank Ben Guthrie. I don't think he's online, but he has volunteered very kindly his wife to do a proofread of this later. So um, she'll look at this and and she'll she'll give her finishing uh, touches to to the to the pamphlet after it's finalized. So I uh, just go over really quick. This won't take very long. Um, I wish I was there now in, in Griffith with you all doing this, but um, I'll have to go through it on Zoom, which is fine. Uh, so really quick, I use. Um, InDesign to put this together. And um, I've been using InDesign for a long time now. I'm pretty fluent in most um, Adobe products. So it's not necessarily hard actually figuring out the, the layout as much as it is finding the images and deciding what 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 will fit in in this when there's so many people providing so many beautiful um, images daily and and taking such beautiful images and 
Uh, I did realize that the group, the club, has less and less images of our, of our club itself and more of, of astronomy, which is beautiful. Uh, however, I do think that our club and our um, and our outreach is also valuable. And I do want to end up providing some more outreach images in this ultimately at the end of the day. Uh, it didn't go very far from Evan's original design. I have pretty much all the content the same as, as his, his was, maybe slightly uh, adjusted and moved around. Um, but for the most part, and um, some things that have changed are Previously at Lockwood, we had a couple um, six to 16 inch and 38, 31 inch reflecting telescope, which are, are no longer there. So uh, those have been updated on this and we're talking about our new, our new um, binoscope and thanks, thanks um, to Keith. Cause I was like, oh, what are they all called? That's what, what can everyone use up at, at Lockwood? And he's like, he like listed them out for me and then like writing them out. And, um, so there's a, there's Keith here, a uh, picture of Keith, some Garvey images. Um, we're also going to, everything's a little bit more updated. There's some things like Ford Observatory that's the same, and that's purely because I don't have any more images. I don't have any newer images of it. Um, and I would like to, after this, just open up the idea of me providing like a Google, a Google, um, like a Google uh, link that people can maybe drop some images off for me to add if, if they think that um, they would fit in into this particular category so uh, of the pamphlet. And obviously uh, all of these are gonna be, I'm gonna be giving the names of everyone that's provided. So for example, this new image on the top right was from Ben Guthrie's website, which he posted online a few weeks ago. And I asked for his permission for this, but um, along with all, all the other ones, I do wanna ask everyone, done who I am using for permission I'm hoping they will say yes and they'll definitely be uh, be uh, credited on each of their images this one was and Andy Parmalee she it's one of her first times uh, coming to the park and seeing us there but she got this wonderful image of um of us during an event, an event before um a star party and you can see our alias uh our alias tent in the background and our old uh, 26, is that what it was? And and um, yeah, I think I think it's coming along really well. And a couple other things like maybe Facebook, or we'll have Facebook. I don't know if these still work. I, I have no idea, I've not checked them. I don't have either Facebook or what is now X. So this might be updated. Uh, and if anyone can let me know, maybe Evan will double check that for me. Um, but I did. Uh, I did want to show you this, and you can probably, I, I think from, from your screens, from where you're sitting, if you try it, it should take you to our website <laughs> if you want to try it at the actual, um, uh, at the uh, observatory right now if you're sitting there. But um, this wouldn't be this big, and it wouldn't be taking up a quarter of the of, of our half a sheet or a page. But um, I do want to, I do think we should just have maybe four of them and include Instagram. I think Instagram has a lot of followers as well. And people that do go to the star parties definitely ask about it. And uh, um, it's it's also part, I think, part of the big the big deal is the Instagram. So um, yeah, maybe just moving all of them together. Anyway, that, these are just little nuanced um, tidbits that I'm working through the, um, the actual design itself though if you it will it will it will um flip pretty pretty uh pretty cleanly i think and line up very nicely they're graphed very well and um, hopefully i'll do a, a couple that we can look at before the final one is decided on but this is where i'm at and i still may i still have room for more things and so i'm thinking of spreading them out a little bit more and putting a few more pictures a couple more pictures in here uh, and I'm definitely up for any um, encouragement or suggestions. Um, yeah, and I'm having a lot of fun doing it. And I'm really grateful that I, I have the opportunity to, to work on this now. I, I just, uh, yeah, thanks. So that, that's it. Yeah.
we have to get out of here in 20 minutes. So if we're going to do a door prize drawing, we should do the internal drawing now so that we can get out of here on time without making people mad at us. All right, then for those on Zoom, I've posted the link for the drawing. Oh, and uh, if Victoria's still in the room, well, not this room, but on Zoom, the Twitter X thing is no longer there, so I'll just concentrate on the Facebook and Instagram for the brochure. Perfect. Everybody's going to leave X anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Plus, our Instagram has a pretty big following. Yeah. All right, so here's a mic, whoever wants it. If you didn't get a door price ticket, come down here and get one now. You tell them, Tim. How many are we doing uh, on site? And then we'll, we'll do all the ones uh, at Griffith, and we'll do the ones on Zoom later separately, right? You want to do the ones here first, and then we'll yeah, go on that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, OK. We can do that. OK. Ready to go? Yeah, let's, let's do this. Oh, crap. <laughs> Okay, first tires. number. You ready? Got your tickets out? Everybody has one? Here we go. 8334763. Got a winner? Oh, my God. Phil, you got it? All right. <laughs> Phil! Congrats. <laughs> you want a laser, Phil? Yeah, bring it down. To, or here, I'll, I'll meet you halfway, Phil. What do you got? Yeah, we got lasers. We have a lot of stuff. We even have a Keurig down here. Yeah, right. I know. It's one of those days. It's okay, awesome. those of you on Zoom, go ahead and uh, register now, and uh, I'll close it off uh, in a couple of minutes. Okay. So they'll come get it after us. That is a match. 763. Thank you. Next person. Eight three three four seven seven two. Ah! Oh, you also want a laser. Alicia's mom. Oh, God. Well, it's rigged tonight. I had like nothing to do with this. Like we need another one at home. We got so many lightsabers too. Oh man. <laughs> he said she wanted a. Do you have the ticket? Take it. There you go. I, can we That's give it correct. to Dave? What's that? We, oh, we're just going to give it to D Dave. We've got a lot of them at home. I tr Trust me. I My home is full of lasers. Here, it's yours. I'm passing it over to you. Here, yeah. have it. Yeah, seriously. Take, come and take it. After all these years since joining uh, LAS. All right. Hand. Thank you, Dave. Uh, last number, 8334779. Uh, all right. Yay. Somebody different. All right. All right. You won an Eclipse book. I'm going to send it to you. Come down here so that we can get it to you. It's the America's First Great Eclipse, How Scientists, Tourists, and the Rocky Mountain Eclipse of 1878 Changed Astronomy Forever by Steve Ruskin. It's a really good book. Great. And we've got an eclipse coming up in April, so Perfect listen timing. down. Okay, so, we're good. So we'll get your information afterwards, okay? Okay. okay. That's cool. it. Right? Three? Sure, Set. Yeah, can you write it there? And again, and don't forget to come five. to the banquet January 28th, guys. It's going to be great. We and got a lot, right of, lot of great giveaways right. there. A lot of good stuff we have. Uh, we're getting some special gifts from uh, Woodland Hills uh, Telescope and Binocular Company. So they're going to give us some things. So okay, we're ready for the uh, online drawings now? Yep, go ahead. Oh. Okay, let me do a oh, screen share. Oh you, oh, you got one more? Go ahead, then. More? Okay. Yeah, we, we got more stuff Okay, I'll do one more here. Keep going. And then we'll go to online. Yep, one more. Here we go. The number is uh, 8334 771. 771. Anybody? Maybe I don't know. Is it you, Dave? 771. Okay, I'll take another one. Try another one. Okay, one more. We'll try another one. Last one.
Okay, final number, 8334770. You want to correct? Right. Man with the man with the Mount Wilson tone the shirt working. Okay, come on over here. You get a what is he what did he get? What is it's that? An icy hot curry. An icy hot iced hot curry iced tea. You can make coffee machine. Wow. You can make coffee with that. We expect you to be a Garvey and make us some tea. Well thanks. You're welcome. Thank you. Congratulations. All right. I got some great gifts coming up, like I say, January twenty eighth. Be at the uh, we awesome. need you guys to come Thank up you. and meet us at the uh, at the uh, banquet. It's gonna be a lot of fun. Okay, so I'm sharing a screen now for the, and this, these are for the online people. Okay, Jose yeah, yeah, right. is the first one. All right. Who is there? Jose? Uh -huh. Yeah. Jose won the Constellation drinking glasses. Oh. Okay. Next one is Victor <laughs> Victoria. Yay, first time, and I'm not here online. Victoria won an LAS store item from our LAS store. Okay, next. Nasir. Nasir won the Observer Sky Atlas by Eric Karkoshka. Right, thanks. Okay, and Richard. Richard won the Observer's Map of the Moon. Okay. Is that it? Yep. Okay. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for all the volunteers, for all the attendees. Yes, our next meeting is in February. We will see you at the banquet in January. It's going to be at the banquet. At the banquet, yeah, as I said. We'll see you at the banquet on January 28th. Our next general meeting will be in February. Thank you, everyone, and have a great night. And if you don't come to the banquet, I will hunt you down, each one of you, so you better be there. <laughs> That's All right. Thompson. Good night. They didn't call me Sergeant Thompson for nothing. <laughs> Good night. <laughs>